Over the past few months, we have been exploring the theme of renewal through multiple lenses. We are at the tail end of our series. Actually, this is the second to the last one. Next week will be the last sermon. Looking back, I have this uh, question for you. What is the one new way you have or are now experiencing renewal? What is the one new way you are experiencing renewal? Who has been your companion on this journey of renewal? What one new change are you practicing now that you worried before the series began? Just one new thing that you started practicing as a result of this series. Friends, our text today read by Haniel is a very familiar text. The author of Hebrews draws the attention of his first readers to the need to be different in their beliefs and their behaviors. He presented the basis, the means, and the manner of this new life. Two bases that he articulated in chapter 4 of Hebrews, verses 14 through 16, is that the person of Jesus and his work should be the basis of our new life. And the means and the manner in which we express this new life is through our conviction and the confession of our mouth. The author wants the first readers to be different. That's why the challenges are seek to have them compromise. For the author, Christ's coming and his sacrifice, it's community forming. In other words, the coming of Christ is to start a community, if you will, a family of God. As we witness the challenges of our modern world, it's easy to feel isolated and in need of rejuvenation. It is easy to feel weary. It is through our shared journey, support and love for one another that we find inspiration to grow and draw closer to God and revitalize our spirit. In a world where individualism often prevails, it is crucial to rediscover the transforming power of a Christ-centered community. Today's scripture offers a beautiful portrait of how true renewal is found within the faithful community of believers. So you can see that our focus is more inward today. Sisters and brothers, renewal is a process we all long for. Let me say this, renewal is not a product or a destination. And it is best realized in the community. Friends, not in isolation. It has to be in the community. Throughout this section, particularly, when you start reading from verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 10, there is a shift in the language used by the author. Beginning from verse 16, the author started using a first-person plural to address his readers. This is clearly an emphasis to demonstrate that the coming of Jesus it's for a reason, and this is the reason that you are to be together in a community. And when you are in a community, this is what you need to do. And we'll be talking about those things later. This community is not just a gathering, but a place where we truly belong. A place where we find refuge. A place where we are seen and heard. 
A place where we share our joys and share our burdens as well. I like what Mary Healy, a Bible commentator, said about this. She beautifully puts it this way, and I quote, The whole New Testament insists the Christian life is inescapable, communal. We are not alone in our journey of faith. Every member is responsible for supporting, building up, encouraging, consoling, calling others to a life of holiness. End of quote. This morning our text presents at least three actions or resolutions, if you will, if we are to be renewed through community. And I will present these three using three letters. That when you use it, it gives the word pi. If you are salivating, you are excused for that. It's not your fault. These three letters will help us understand what we need to do based on our text. And like I said earlier on, my focus this morning is to talk primarily to believers, to those of us in the church. Of course, we can find renewal outside of the church as well. But I wouldn't be touching on that this morning. So these three letters stand for present, intentional, and engage. So to be renewed through community, we need to be present. We need to be intentional, and we need to be engaged. Let me start with the first, uh, with the second letter, which is I. To be renewed in community, we need to be intentional. And if you look at verse 24, it says, "Let us consider how to stir up one another." to love and good works. This is the last of three exhortations that the author uh, is wanting his first readers, and of course by extension us, to consider. This highlights the faith that shouldn't be abstract, but rather be an expression and a commitment to ethical behavior that mirrors the character of our God, who is the head of this community. I think the point the author seeks to make is that our faith has consequences for the community that he has brought us in. In the New Testament, the word consider means to think of, to notice, to be concerned about, and to look closely the idea here is that the object of your thinking is to be not things, but people when it comes to community. These are specific people with real names, with stories, with life experiences and realities. But what does it mean to consider one another in the context of renewal through community? I think it means to first recognize the humanity in one another. In this way, we mirror back the image of God, the beauty, the strength, the capability and the ability of people. This recognition begins the journey of knowing one another beyond the surface. One of the books that I've read recently is How to Know a Person, the Art of Seeing Others, deeply and being deeply seen by David Brooks. He described the power of being seen and ways not to see one another. When we intentionally see another individual correctly, he said that you act as an illuminator. You illuminate someone. But when you you see someone, not in the right way, you are acting as a diminisher. A diminisher 
makes people feel small, unseen, and as disposable objects. On the other hand, an illuminator makes people feel bigger, respected, valued, and even worthy. I think the author of Hebrew is drawing our attention to be illuminators in our walk with God. Listen attentively to these questions from Paul Tripp in his book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. People in need of change, helping people in need of change. This is a very long quote from him. There are questions, basically. Think of someone you believe you know well. Try to identify some of the gaps in your understanding of his or her story. The question is, how much do you know of your friend's family of origin? Do you know where, I'll just use one pronoun so that I don't keep going back and forth, where she struggles in her relationship with God, or even in his understanding, or her understanding of the scripture? What do you know about the quality of their marriage? or the struggle they experience with their spouses. If the person is single, do you know how they spend the hours alone? And if she's a mother or a father, does this person think that they are a failure when it comes to parenting? Could your friend be fighting disintegrating relationship at work or even long-term bitterness with extended family members? Perhaps their heart is driven by loss or eaten up with bitterness. Might this person be harboring deep regret over the past decision they've made or jealousy over or even envious over the success of another friend? Are there financial woes or physical problems? Could there be a feeling of abandonment by others? A feeling of being unjustly treated? These are some questions that this author wants us to consider as we seek to know one another, as we seek to make ourselves available in the hands of God to be instruments that stimulate others unto love and good works. He goes on to say this, and I quote, that is straight now. We tend to have permanently casual relationships that never grow into real intimacy. Our effectiveness as ambassadors is blunted because we don't know others well enough to know where change is needed or where God is actively at work in their lives. End of quote. Sisters and brothers, I wonder if you need to stimulate others. But also I wonder if that is being blunted by superficiality as you relate with them. Should I encourage you to resolve to be genuine even as you seek to stimulate others unto love and good deeds? When we intentionally know others, we find more creative and constructive ways to stimulate them into love and good deeds. Our real source of love and good deed is God, who guides us and inspires us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it reads, For we are God's handwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If we as a community of believers in Christ cannot extend grace and love by being intentional within the family of God, I think it will certainly be difficult to extend grace to those outside. But with God's guidance, we can do all things. Not only are we to be intentional in seeking renewal or offering renewal in community, but we need to be present. Friends, we can best be agents of transformation 
in community when we are present. In verse 25, the author clarifies how to stimulate one another to love. First, he provides this idea in negative term. In 25a, he says, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some. Notice the author did not say, as a habit of all, but some. I think there is a message here for us, that there is a conscious choice made by the people that are not part of the community. This is stated in negative. And the word is really stronger than just to neglect. Neglect sounds like, well, I'm unable to do it now. I'll get to it later. No, that's not what the author is communicating. If you look at the original language. The word translated as neglect here echoes the language of covenant unfaithfulness. It is to abandon. It is to forsake. I think the author appears to be addressing fellow believers who have chosen to isolate themselves from others in pursuit of their own comfort and convenience. When you decide not to meet with other believers, you starve them of living faithfully into their calling. Brothers and sisters, renewal through community cannot happen in isolation. We can see that the author is very careful to encourage them to gather together for mutual encouragement. Friends, I'm aware that sometimes this passage is used to guilt trip us to attend every church activities. That is not what the author is communicating here, period. That is not what he's communicating. Rather, it is to be present with other people and have a more consistent, regular involvement in their life. I know that another concern will be, oh, in person versus virtual. Our friends that are streaming live now, or who will be watching later. I'm sure that before COVID-19, most people didn't imagine the possibility of worshiping by leveraging technology. Most of us didn't believe that we can do that. But I think now our perspective perhaps has changed a little bit. But remember that what the author is getting at is isolation that becomes a habit. Not isolation as a result of circumstances. These are two different things. My contention is that the author is inviting us that yes, there might be situations where you have to stream live or watch later, but that shouldn't be the norm. We shouldn't normalize that. Listen to what James Hunter Davidson says, and I quote, I think it should be there. The worship of God, the cultivation of friendship, the conduct of business, and the expression of anger and hostility, the pursuit of romantic affection, the experience of natural war, all presuppose physical presence. End of quote. But you will agree with me also that technology and COVID are increasingly redefining our physical interaction. Nonetheless, being present is worth the attempt. When you are present with others, you are in proximity to them. It shapes and changes our perspective about our reality. Especially with globalization. Just read an article that was beautifully put that 
difference is now omnipresent. You know that word? Because of globalization, you encounter difference wherever you are. You don't need to go looking for it. You encounter it. But when you're in close proximity with others who are different or who are likely to be different or who you perceive them to be different, there is something that happens to you. It changes your perspective. It gives you another lens to look at things. Proximity helps us to notice the gains and the losses of people around us. So gains might be something like promotion, place of work, completion of education, getting new pet, celebrating birthdays like some are celebrating today, some celebrated a few days ago, opportunity to go for a vacation, or a new or a quality job. The losses might be social losses, cultural losses, might be economic losses, or even emotional loss. Some might be experiencing what sociologists or anthropologists call liminality, a life of in-between as a result of transition. Being present with them will help you identify where they are and you can help them be renewed, be transformed. Such people will need someone to be present by asking them of their situation and not assuming their situation. They will benefit more if your presence connects you with them before you start correcting them. Distance does not help when it comes to relationships like this. Friends, look at how Jesus interacted with people. How do you see people who have different religion? I'm going to talk about that in my next point. But how do you see people who are different? People who have different religion, who might have po different political views with you, or cultural differences. Or maybe their class is not like yours. They have a different gender. Now, I once heard a pastor tell a story about a young woman whose husband had died, leaving her with a small son, a young child. Back home from the cemetery, they went to bed early because there was nothing to do. As she lay there in the darkness, grief-stricken and heartbroken, this little boy broke that silence with this question. Mommy, where is daddy? The mother got up and brought the little boy to bed with her. But the child was still very disturbed and restless. Occasionally, he will ask questions such as, why isn't he here yet? When is he going to come back? <laughs> Finally, the little boy changed his strategy. He said, Mommy, if your face is towards me, I think I can go to sleep. And that worked magic. The moment his mom turned towards him, gazing at him. He fell asleep. This is the power of presence. It heals. It comforts. It encourages. Notice that I'm talking about presence. I'm not just talking about you doing something but just being present with the person. It does wonders. As a matter of our presence matters to God. Think of the incarnation, friends. In John Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, it reads, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This 
word made its dwelling, his dwelling with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And then Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, verses 5 through 8, excuse me. It reads, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing but by taking the very nature of servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus entered into our space to be present with us. Incarnation is a mystery for us, but at the same time, it is a model for us to mirror in our relationship with one another. And I like what Paul said, that in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset, the same view, that you are ready to empty yourself of power, of privilege, of position, of glory, so that you can enter into another person's space. Why? When you don't do that, you don't come to their level. Like Aunt Wendy did this morning when she was uh, sharing with the children. She came down to their level so that they can have conversation. That is what Jesus did. I've never seen an angel. Maybe you have seen. But from the story that I've Right, and the experience is shared. People said angels are terrifying. Angels. Then imagine God, the Creator, coming with all of His glory to interact with us. I think there is a lesson there for us that in community we should intentionally. Choose to let go for the sake of the other. Craig Van der Gelder and Dwight Schley had to learn the pronunciation of this name. They state this about the incarnation, and I quote, The incarnation is a profound, concrete act of God's participatory presence. God enters into and takes upon himself our sinfulness and shares with us his righteousness, end of quote. Church family, our participatory presence in the life of others is transforming. It's an agent of transformation. It's an agent of renewal. Lastly, not only are we to be intentional, to be present, but we need to engage with one another. You can see the flow that the Hebrew writer is drawing us into. He said in verse 25b, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That is the day of the law. To encourage means to urge strongly. Teammates on a field encourage one another. Sometimes you hear words like, come on, let's go, keep it up. Good, great job. Oh, that's a good throw. Oh, that's a good kick. Oh, pick up the pace. Let's go. Dig deeper into something. Encouragement. It's powerful. It's a powerful too when it comes to renewal. Whether through a kind word, a helping hand, or a listening ear, we can significantly impact each other's lives when we intentionally present in their life, and engage in conversation. Brothers and sisters, in a supportive community, members can find courage and strength to face challenges, knowing they are not alone. This mutual encouragement, rooted in our faith, revitalizes our spirit and helps us to stay steadfast in our call. And exhortation can range from instruction 
encouragement or remind us or even warnings or rebukes. But exhortation is always communicative. This is especially clear if we look at Acts 15, 32. It reads, And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. Friends, we'll experience God's grace in community through words when used appropriately. It's one thing to be together. It's another thing to speak the truth of God. As Paul reminded us in Ephesians 4.29, he said, let, and I quote, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. And it may give, that it may give grace to those who hear. You can see that when we speak to one another, especially in the context of encouraging them, we, ex we are providing grace that enables them to live a victorious life. Jesus modeled to us how to be present, to be intentional, and engage with people around us. Let me use two examples to illustrate this. John chapters 3 and 4. It's a very familiar story. In John 3, we encounter Nicodemus. It was a conversation that was started by him. It appears Nicodemus was experiencing a kind of religious dissonance because of some of Jesus' teaching. He came to Jesus seeking clarity. Jesus invited him to reimagine a faith that does not only radically change life, but is also profoundly unpredictable. In John 3.8, Jesus said, the wind blows where it pleases. We all remember the response from this great teacher. His response was, how can this be if you are telling me that I need to be born from above or using our familiar language to be born again? Then we move to the next chapter. We encounter Jesus with a woman that is referred to as a Samaritan woman. I don't know why John decided to use that. But we'll go with that. Similarly, Jesus is inviting her to reconsider her understanding, her theology. But we can see that her response is different from that of the religious leader. She didn't, she didn't ask, how can this be that God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth? Rather, he simply confessed, Jesus, you are the savior of the world. In John 4, 42. You can see that in both conversations, Jesus did not shame, embarrass, or stereotype any of them because of anything, not even Nicodemus, insufficient knowledge, or the woman's gender or class. No. He was present listening to them, but guiding them towards what he will love for them to know. I'm glad that it is Jesus that encountered these two people. And I want to say this to Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman that if it were to be Zach's, the story would have been written differently. Because I would have rebuked the religious leader. Where is your theology? Why did you spend all of these thousands of dollars to go to seminary and yet 
you have insufficient knowledge. Or maybe the woman, I want to say, hey, you don't belong to this group. But Jesus modeled to us how to encounter people in community. He was intentional in his interactions with them. He was present, listening to them. When you're talking to someone and that person is not there, you know it. Let me make a cultural digression. Here in the West, when one of the ways to know that someone is present with you is when the person is looking at you eyeball to eyeball, isn't it? That is not the same thing in Nigeria. No. I don't talk to, like, let me use Haniel as his father. He, he will not talk to me, looking at me eyeball to eyeball. That would be considered disrespect. The reason I'm bringing this is to go back to what I said earlier on. You need to know people for who they are and not project your understanding on them. This woman, culturally speaking, she's different from Jesus. But Jesus was comfortable with that difference. And he engaged with her meaningfully. As we engage with people, do we do so as diminishers or do we do so as eliminators? What kind of people earn our entire presence? Let me close with this from Pope. Francis, when he visited Washington, he reminded us, and I quote, the spirit of the world tells us to be like everyone else. To settle for what comes is, then he emphasized, we must regain the conviction that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for others, and the world as well. Church family, I invite you to go and be intentional. Go and be present. Go and engage with others. In so doing, you bring renewal and we will receive renewal from one another. <coughs>